So, so the title of my presentation is Algorithms and Computation, but I thought that uh, let's start by marveling actually how efficient and powerful today's computers are. So, so here's something to think about. So you've probably heard that the processor in your computer has, has compute cores. So let's, let's think about uh, those first. So, so a typical single modern processor core in your handheld device, in your laptop, or or not, actually. It executes about one billion instructions per second. So what is an instruction? Well, if you're a computer aficionado, I mean, you can see here some machine language. So there are these little operations that take place literally, I mean, sort of billions of times per second inside a single compute core. So if you think about that and think about something that happens a billion times per second. So one billionth of a second is in physics terms called one nanosecond. So in one nanosecond, actually, if you operate at the speed of light, so the distance that you travel is 30 centimeters. So think about that. So this is the time, for example, to execute. I mean, we add, let's say, the integer 8 here to a single processor register. And it happens in, in that short amount of time. Now, let's scale up a little bit and really start marveling, actually, how powerful devices we have at our use in terms of conducting science. So here is, for example, one of the more powerful supercomputers on the planet. So this is the Titan supercomputer at Oak Ridge. It's the number three computer on the planet. I chose it because it has such a wonderful picture available and it's in the public domain. And this computer actually has 50 million of these cores, every single one of them executing one billion instructions more or less per second. So these are immensely powerful devices. In case you're wondering about Finland, so Finland currently ranks in the supercomputing table. Our most powerful computer is in, in position 69. But let's just do a little bit of arithmetic here. So, so we get one billion instructions per second per core. And if I'm using, for example, that entire supercomputer, so it amounts to actually 10 million billion instructions per second. Think about the power that's available to you. And this is just one computer. Now consider all the things on the planet and you start seeing actually how powerful things we are working with. Okay, but the talk is about algorithms. So if you want me to simplify and abstract basically what are algorithms, well, they are the ideas actually that harness this power of computation that we have at our disposal, thanks to the physicists, uh, to solve specific tasks. So, of course, algorithms exist for numerous purposes. Let's say they add, multiply, divide, evaluate, interpolate, so on and whatnot, up to also, of course, the more advanced applications. So, so basically, algorithms are, are the things that make, make computers run today, and in particular, efficient algorithms. Of course, I mean, we need to specify these individual instructions that we execute at these mind-boggling rates. And we measure efficiency, of course, by the total number of instructions that actually you uh, execute to, to get the task done. Equally well, of course, we can measure the running time, the energy we use in terms of joules, or if you will, let's say memory capacity, communication, and whatnot. So it's about algorithms. And of course, algorithms are designed to solve specific tasks. Let's say multiply two integers, divide two integers, or maybe do some uh, electronic signing for purposes of contracting or, or whatnot. So I thought that we might want to look at two rather innocent looking and maybe simple, some of them extremely classical computational problems, just to motivate you to the sort of task what, what an algorithm designer faces in his or her business. So here are two problem settings. So both of them actually involving integers. So so the left hand side, we have a classical task, the greatest common divisor. So given two positive integers, call them R0 and R1, if you want a concrete example. So here we have two eight digit integers. Find the greatest integer that divides both of these two. And on the right hand side, uh, we also seem to have a problem involving integers. So given a few positive integers here, is there a subset actually that sums, I mean, of, of these first n things here, that sums to the target, which is here. So yet again, we have an example. So can I pick some of these integers here so that their sum actually evaluates this particular number? Of course, these are small example instances meant to um, illustrate what an algorithm sort of in general needs to do. So you can have any, any integers as input and you actually need to produce the correct solution. So let's just look at uh, two solutions for, 
for this problem. So here we actually see that it's actually 10,243. That's the greatest common divisor. It sort of divides both, both of these integers. And here, if you thought about it a little bit, so it's actually these three different integers here that, that sum up to the, to the target. So far, so good. Of course, this is a simple toy example, but an algorithm designer wants to, of course, have, have a generic solutions here, and we want scalability. So what if the inputs are larger? Let's think about a variant of the problem that I'm actually not giving to you explicitly, but suppose now actually here on the left-hand side, we have two integers with about one million digits. And on the right-hand side, we have 1,000 integers with about 1,000 digits each. I'm not printing them out, but you can imagine. It's a little bit bigger, but not that large. If you think in terms of megabytes, it would be actually about one megabyte in, in total. So pretty small in today's terms. We have machines that can handle terabytes without breaking sweat. Okay, so now we actually start seeing that these, these problems differ in the sense that Actually, with an appropriate algorithm, of course, you need to carefully design it and so forth. We will see actually an example. The left-hand side thing you can run on your smartphone. It has perfectly sufficient compute capability to, to solve this. But on the right-hand side, actually, even with the best-known algorithms, I mean, best-known algorithms to humanity, we, we cannot solve this problem. We have no idea how, how to do it efficiently, actually. Even if we use all the computing power on the planet, all of this immense computing power. Okay, and maybe I wanted to mention the greatest common divisor because it's actually one of the sort of earliest algorithm designs dating back all the way to actually 300 BC before our positional number system, the Euclidean algorithm or Euclid's algorithm. So, so it's, it's one of the one of the classics, and this needs to be actually reinforced a little bit to get to a million digits on your smartphone, but not by much. So algorithms have been around basically for a long, long, long time. It was actually stated in, in the language of, of geometry and in terms of measuring lengths way back in 300 BC when Euclid compiled his, his elements or elementa. But then the other problem, namely subset sum, is actually an example of, of things that we don't actually know how to solve efficiently. It's an example of something called an NP-complete problem that's actually a sort of case of, of this more general setup that is actually one of the deepest problems currently in, in all, of, all of science in the sense that uh, uh, we would like to know whether actually all computational problems that have efficiently verifiable, verifiable solutions um, yeah, also have efficiently computable solutions. For example, in the, in the case of the subset sum problem, once you see a solution, so you're given the subset of integers that sum to the target, it's easy to check. But we don't know how to find the solution. And it's, it's not known. And, and actually solving any one of these individual NP-complete problems, the subset sum problem that I showed to you being one of the examples of problems in this class, uh, would suffice. And this class was discovered about 40 years ago, actually a little bit more, in 19, 1971. And we still don't know. And we would dearly like to know because this class of NP complete problems contains literally thousands of, of fundamentally important things that we would like to, like to solve, but don't yet know how to do, unfortunately. Okay, so, so why study algorithms and computation? So of course, I mean, efficient algorithms sort of enable the modern world. And of course, the world of the future, so we want increasingly efficient algorithms. Also in the case when we know extremely efficient algorithms, we want them to be even more efficient so that we can scale to increasingly large amounts of data. So I mean, even if we can do a million billion instructions per second, try working with a petabyte. And of course, then things start getting more more challenging and you need increasingly efficient solutions. Also, we would like to, of course, understand computational intractability in terms of NP completeness. And also, unfortunately, one thing that I would also like to mention is the approaching physical limits of, of computer microarchitecture. So if you think about it at, at the clock rate, I mean, that we currently have, light moves this about uh, 30 centimeters at most. So you cannot necessarily increase clock speeds anymore and, and you have to resort to extra parallelism. So you need new mathematical ideas and architecture adaptable algorithms are essentially 
I mean, pretty soon, probably the, the only way, way to scale up. So research into algorithms is extremely important. So, so what I'm doing at, at Alto Computer Science, so at the Computatorial Algorithms Group, so we basically develop theory, mathematics for design and analysis of algorithms, and also we do some algorithm engineering. So literally low-level implementations that take out most of the performance of the, of the machine that you can, can have. <clears throat> okay, so if you want to classify in terms of traditional algorithmics uh, where my, my work mostly is, so it's sort of trying to uh, understand and cope with, with MP completeness in, in various senses and, and these things that have been developed uh, over the years, different theories, the theory of approximation algorithms, exact exponential algorithms that we actually had the privilege with Fedia Fomin a couple of years back to, to review for the broader computer science community, parameterized algorithms, we'll see an example, and more recently that I was doing in, in Berkeley last year, basically fine-grained algorithm design. So we try to transport this technology developed in the context of studying NP completeness into, into the analysis of uh, sort of tractable, tractable problems. So I'll try to give a quickly a few examples here. So I mentioned the subset sum problem, so it's, it's not by accident. We've been working on it for, for quite some time. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a challenge. The record algorithm is from 1974, and it hasn't been, I mean, improved since then in terms of worst case performance. What we now know, for example, is that if you look at additively pseudo-random inputs, then we can get a little bit of improvement. So this is joint work with Par Ostrin, uh, Mikko Koivisto from the University of Helsinki, Paris at KTH, and, and Jesper is at Eindhoven currently, and so forth. Parameterized algorithms. So actually NP completeness in the case of some problems is, is not as bad as it sounds because you can introduce parameters into the input, and as long as those parameters remain small, actually we get extremely scalable solutions. So for example, one of the uh, sort of examples of this is, is our work on the so-called graph motive problem. Actually, if, if the motive size, the thing that we are searching uh, from big amounts of data remains small, uh, we get linear scalability. So literally, we can work with hundreds of gigabytes of data and then beyond even though the problem is NP-complete in, in its general form. Of course, we need to assume that the parameter is small. Uh, here's some further work uh, in terms of discovering correlations in, in large amounts of data, but in the interest of keeping time, maybe I'll, I'll actually skip a detailed description of, of this. And then here's maybe, maybe the last thing that I would like to advertise a little bit, maybe, because I think it's sort of important. I already mentioned that computer microarchitecture seems to be maturing a little bit. So a single computer core actually is perhaps quite unlikely to get substantially more, more efficient as time progresses. So basically where the hardware performance gains come from are increased amounts of parallelism. So you put more cores, introduce this large distributed system. So think about the supercomputer I, I displayed to you. So this of course means that you start having extensive physical setups. And once some physics start and start substantially entering the picture, so actually you get errors into the computation. So then you need to design algorithms that cope with errors and also produce correctness proofs. That basically the computation was, was correctly executed and these proofs need to be easily checked. And actually to connect to the Euclidean algorithm that I, I talked to you about, I mean introduced a couple of thousand years back. So some of the mathematical ideas underlying the Euclidean algorithm are also actually present in this work in terms of how we correct the errors. Instead of working with integers, we work with polynomials, but, but nevertheless. So, so we are using so-called fast read Solomon decoders, but the best known algorithms currently are, are actually based on, on the Euclidean algorithm, and so forth. So let me quickly start concluding. So why study algorithms on computation? So I sort of gave you a few few ideas, so they, of course, are to a large extent enables of, of, of the modern world. We want to get scalability to, I don't know, petabytes of, of data or, or beyond. We want to understand this phenomenon of intractability. We want to understand the NP-completeness and NP-complete problems. And also in terms of we need to start tailoring our algorithm designs more and more into this emerging parallel and, and some architecture adaptable world. So, so maybe to to conclude, I would like to give you a picture of, of Berkeley Hills, basically I spent, I mean this is, is taken about one year ago, uh, 
And I frequently, when I was at the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing, wanted to go up the hill and sort of see the perspectives and uh, think about algorithm design and so forth. And I, I was giving you a pessimistic picture in terms of computer architecture evolution, but, but then again, we shouldn't necessarily, at least as of yet, be that, that pessimistic because actually just last week, uh, in a lab down the hill here, uh, they introduced a one nanometer transistor, which is, uh, I think, about at least 10 times smaller than, than they currently have uh, manufacture, in manufacture at Intel. So, so maybe we still ride this exponential growth curve in terms of computing performance for a couple of years. But in case we don't, then algorithm designers need to come, come to rescue. Thanks. Thank you.